All right, I think we should start getting this thing going. Hello, and welcome to the AGU course forum on making FAIR's interoperability and reusability data goals possible. Today is the third of our course forums for this year. It is being co-hosted with our colleagues from the American Geophysical Union. Our two organizations came together for today's event to promote the growing importance of this forum's topic. Today's forum of over 200 registrants would not be possible without the generous sponsorship coming from our gold sponsors, ACS, AIP Publishing, Royal Society of Chemistry, and SPIE, and our silver sponsors, Silverchair. So Chorus is a community effort dedicated to making open research work. Our goals are to help our main stakeholders of publishers, institutions, and funders scale their OA compliance. We work to develop metrics about open data. We improve the overall quality of their metadata related to open research and host forums and workshops like today's forum to connect the stakeholders so they can learn and hopefully build trust with each other. As our speakers present today, feel free to use Zoom's QA feature found at the bottom of the Zoom window to ask your questions. They will either be answered by the speakers live or in the QA window. Also, feel free to upvote questions that you think are important, so we are sure to get to them. Today's forum will run into 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and will also be recorded for later viewing. We have two excellent sessions lined up for you, both moderated by Shelley Stahl of AGU. Session one will be the problem of actually doing interoperability and reusability and why it's important. This will be followed by a short break around 10 minutes including an interactive poll where we'd like to hear back from all of you. Then on to session two, highlighting existing, existing partial solutions regarding interoperability and reusability. So without any further ado, over to you, Shelley. Thank you, Howard. Uh, we are really delighted to have our speakers today. Um, so let me, uh, let me talk to you a little bit about FAIR. We've made a big assumption that the folks that are attending understand where interoperability and reusability come from. There is uh, uh, the FAIR guiding principles uh, uh, by Wilkerson et al. was published in 2016. And this has been a uh, real opportunity for no matter which discipline you're in to focus efforts around making data and other digital objects uh, more FAIR, where it stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And as the community has been um, grappling in varied ways of doing this, uh, we are seeing that findable and accessible tends to be a fairly achievable goal, uh, and we are doing well in this area. Uh, but interoperability and reusability are incredibly difficult and more complex to resolve. And so for our first session, we're going to talk about those challenges. And in our second session, we're going to talk about, um, and you'll know we're just scratching the surface because many of you, uh, I can see from the participant list, are actually working on these challenges. But we're trying to make it more public and more aware uh, and that we need more help, more broad help to work together. Um, and we'll have three speakers that talk to um, uh, existing work around those areas. So let's get started. Um, Christopher Markham, he's the Assistant Director for Open Science and Data Policy at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Chris holds a PhD in sociology and is a mathematical sociologist and data scientist in the fields of biomedical and sociology and statistics fields. He'll be followed by Ingrid Dillo, who's the Deputy Director of DONS, the Dutch National Center of Expertise and Repository for Research Data, uh, Ingrid is also the co-chair of the Research Data Alliances Council. Um, Ingrid holds a PhD in history and has worked in the field of policy development for the last 30 years, including senior policy advisor at the Dutch Ministry of Education, Culture and Science and the National Library of the Netherlands. And among her areas of expertise are research data management and the certification of digital repositories. So following their two talks, we will uh, have Q&A, but please, if you think of something, put it in the Q&A. Uh, Chris, go ahead and take it away, please. All right, uh, thank you, uh, Shelley, for that, that introduction. I, I first of all wanna uh, begin by thanking Chorus 
uh, and AGU for the invitation to speak uh, briefly today at the forum about policy and practice opportunities. Uh, I, as Shelley mentioned, for what many recognize is the real tough part of, uh, of FAIR, uh, which is data interoperability and reusability. In addition uh, to open science data policy uh, in my portfolio, I help lead the scientific integrity and data security um, uh, portfolios at OSTP. Both of those uh, topics, of course, intersect, I think, very clearly uh, with data fairness. Although for the talk today, I just want to be clear that my focus here is on digital data sharing and not physical samples, not lab notes or ethnographic materials, or uh, and certainly that the uh, the ephemeral aspects uh, and material aspects of, of, of data are very important and they're worth uh, discussion as other scientific products um, for conversations in the future about fairness. Chorus uh, has asked me to provide some guiding points today about why interoperability and reusability are important and to cover a few of the challenges or opportunities rather uh, in achieving those fair ideals from the policy and practice um, side. And so that's, that's what I'll do today. Next slide, please, Howard. So at the top, um, there are really three high level reasons uh, that we see uh, for valuing interoperability and reusability of, of data from the policy and practice perspective. We're broadly characterizing those as trustworthiness, acceleration, and equity. And of course, there are, there are others, but those are the, the focus that I'm gonna talk about today. First, as, as most of us, um, all of us in this forum are aware, that science needs to be replic replicable to be trustworthy. Some disciplines have seen a recent attention drawn to the challenges of rep replicability in their fields, and the reusability of data is a primary mechanism that supports replication of research results. Second, interoperability accelerates discovery. It also accelerates the translation of those discoveries into practice for both academic and business users' data. Barriers to both intra and interdisciplinarity are reduced when data systems can communicate with one another in a, in, in, in a federated system. Putting interoperability and reusability together, okay, that would really allow for data to be combined in new ways to inform and update old results and findings that drive the leading edge of discovery. Further, we have a very strong um, equity portfolio in this administration and the interoperability and reusability support equity in science, particularly salient for federally funded data Ensuring that data can be reused reduces unnecessary duplication, which is of course not the same thing as, as, as replication um, and reproducibility. But and it also provides the ability for new sets of eyes to examine data in new ways. And interoperation helps to more evenly distribute data assets across a highly uneven, evenly funded interdisciplinary landscape in the federal research R&D portfolio. <laughs> so why is interoperability, interoperability and reusability important? Why we want it? They enhance the findability and accessibility components of FAIR, and they make science more inclusive and more equitable. Next slide, please, Howard. So from the policy and practice perspective, we really think that the challenges of achieving broad interoperability and reusability are really just opportunities in that space to innovate with careful forethought. Here, we're pointing to three and such opportunities, and there are there are many more in this space. Uh, this is this is really the leading edge of fairness, um, and they involve research silos, infrastructure needs and guidance standards that, from a policy and, perspective, uh, policy and practice perspective, we can help lead um, uh, to achieve. First, we recognize that research silos contribute to barriers to data sharing broadly. This, also, this includes by lowering the appetite for interoperability and reusability of data. Silos, silos do that. Many have taken the approach um, that research silos need to be broken down. Uh, However, we want to point out, we want to recognize these same silos uh, exist because of their success, because of their achievements. And rather than break them down, we think that there's a real opportunity for policymakers and funders to incentivize opening up those 
traditional silos, building bridges between them and building bridges between established labs. Part of that incentive is in, to lowering the barriers to collaboration by making data more interoperable. Naturally, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, uh, need some water. Uh, naturally, um, uh, these efforts require infrastructure. We include in our definition of infrastructure both technical and human resources. Uh, excellent infrastructure, as we know, exists. We have storage um, capacity. We have data translators and data APIs and common data models. They're all available on the market. Many of you in this room are working on those, um, producing those and putting them out there. And they should be considered for how they can be adapted for use to make data interoperable and reusable. Just as Shelley had mentioned, they have successfully been adapted to make data more findable and accessible. On the policy and practice side, we recognize that closed source proprietary data collection, curation and storage systems can or may impede interoperability. And we should consider as a, as a field, um, if, you, if you wanna consider data sharing field, um, how that may be a barrier to achieving fair data principles um, the world over. Moreover, our investments in interoperability and reusability infrastructure should consider the whole life course of the scientific enterprise and not just the development stage that we are very eager to get, to get off the ground. Training emerging users is extremely important. Um, they're the next generation, but so is training established users. Labs that have traditionally used the silo model can be resourced to develop in, <laughs> interoperability and reusability plans that their incoming cohorts of fellows and early career um, individuals can deploy. Support for retooling established labs, we think is a very strong opportunity here to consider in this, in this space. And of course, that infrastructure is only as good as the standards supporting the actual implementation. So uniform data models, open standards and guidance should be am amendable as new technology and new research paradigms come online. If we wanna realize a future where open data is entirely fair, uh, then those standards will necessarily need to be dynamic. As an example, we uh, recently, the National Science Technology Council Subcommittee on Open Science that I co-chair uh, within our agency, we recently released guidance on desirable characteristics of data repositories for federally funded data. And the guidance concludes with a pretty strong statement that it is intended to be a living document, strong for, for federal guidance anyway. Um, uh, and, and, and really that living document should be revisable uh, with that future in mind. Finally, there's a major opportunity for thought leadership on the ethics and value of how one aspect of data fairness or open data fairness may spill over into other, other aspects. And striving towards interoperability and reusability may help temper some of the downsides of quick shifts in either funding tides or popular enthusiasm for an emerging paradigm. For example, um, the, the, the push towards big data um, that many organizations, many federal agencies sought in recent years was not in hindsight, right? It was not initially concurrent with equal drives for validity and re reliability in, some, <laughs> in those data sets. And some of the approaches, particularly those efforts that involved uh, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, the approaches appear to have assumed an error ignorable data environment. And we've seen the results of that approach, right? We, we know we have models that are over-parameterized and we have results um, that are um, based in algorithmic injustices um, uh, through those approaches. There's an opportunity here to ensure that data models and ontologies seeking greater interoperability and reusability standards build in safeguards for the validity and reliability of that data. Uh, last slide, please, Howard. That, that's all I have um, to, to today. OSTP and, and uh, everyone in my portfolio are uh, very happy to, to, to work with your agencies and organizations. Please feel free to reach out to me through this email and I'm happy to field your questions or, or follow up in the future. Thank you so much, everybody. Chris, thank you so much. That was fantastic. I've written down a bunch of questions myself. Um, so hopefully others are putting their questions into the Q&A. Um, Ingrid, please go ahead. So can you see and hear me? Yes. 
Great. So thanks, Shelley, for your kind introduction. Um, I'm really honored to be invited to this forum and to have the opportunity to talk to you about the challenges of FAIR and the I and the R in particular. And I will do that from a European perspective. Yes, thank you. It shows us in the blink of an eye the enormous global scientific and human challenges that we are faced with today, including climate change, poverty, sustainable development, inequality, to name just a few. These sustainable development goals can only be addressed through cross-domain research, research that tries to understand the complex systems through machine-assisted data analysis, analysis at um, large scale. Next slide. In 2020, the COVID pandemic confronted us with an immediate global health challenge. Of course, we already had efficient IT that improved the global capacity to implement systems to share data during a pandemic. But it also became very clear that the harmonization across these sophisticated but diverse systems still formed a major roadblock. Research and data were abundant, they were multifaceted and globally produced, but there was no universally adopted system or standard to collect, document and disseminate the COVID research outputs. Many outputs turned out not to be reusable and also not to be useful to different communities because they were simply not sufficiently documented and contextualized or appropriately licensed, which is also important. And from this, we learned that open and fair research data are a key component to pandemic preparedness and response. In a COVID reflection in October last year, the NIH stated that more work remains to take full advantage of the troves of research data available. Data sharing, they said, is still slow for many data types, and too much data are released as figures in publications using non-standardized formats or lacking metadata. So that means that they require significant manual curation and harmonization before they can be properly reused by other researchers. Continued implementation of best practices in data management and sharing is thus needed if we want to optimize the use of research data to contribute to the multidisciplinary global challenges that we face. Next slide. Now, when we talk about best practices in research data management, the FAIR principles are an example of the efforts to address this challenge. I happened to be at their birth during a life sciences workshop in Leiden back in 2014 already. And in all honesty, I have to say that it was maybe nothing new Good and responsible data management has been a goal of many communities for much longer. But still, the newfound acronym, I think, has also given a boost to the attention for data. And well, uh, be honest, who could be against FAIR? As with most things, though, it is easier said than done. And we can also read this in the announcement for this forum. Making data findable and accessible turns out to be relatively simple. You need persistent identifiers, core metadata and documentation, adding licenses. But making data truly interoperable and reusable remains a significant challenge. It involves technical and semantic interoperability, which is an entirely different piece of cake requiring much more effort. Next slide. My organization, DANS in the Netherlands, is currently finishing, together with others, a project that is commissioned by the European Commission to survey the European research data landscape. The report will be published shortly. And in this project, we used a FAIR data assessment tool called Fuji that we co-developed in another European project. And we used it to assess the fairness of 8,000 data sets from 31 repositories across Europe. And as you can see on this graph, the average FAIR score of all of those data sets was only 54%. The findability scores were the highest, as we could expect, at 78%, and the reusability scores the lowest at 
Next slide. We also asked some 12,000 European researchers about their awareness of FAIR. And as you can see here, only 18% of them answered that they always put the principle, that they already put the principle into practice. And no less than 70% said that they were not familiar with them or that they have never even heard of them. Next slide. From the FICSHARE International State of Open Data Survey, we know that there is more concern about sharing data sets among researchers than ever before. From both the European and the FICSHARE surveys, it is also clear that the main challenges are not technical. It is about financial constraints, legal and data protection concerns, trust and lack of recognition for the work they do on the data. The time and effort involved in making data fair is also an important impediment. And this shows that implementing fair, including the I and the R, are by no means simply a matter of technical challenges. The cultural change that is needed might even be a bigger hurdle to take. Next slide. In Europe, um, we are currently building what we call a European Open Science Cloud, a research commons for our continent. It is often described as a web of fair data and services for science. The fair principles are center stage in its development and EOSC should give researchers access to data from various sources, which are fair and ideally open. And it needs to adopt standards so that data and services can be combined. The internal European interoperability aim is only useful, of course, if it becomes part of a global interoperable system. Science is global, and so is this challenge, I think. And therefore, initiatives like, for example, the Global Open Research Commons Group within the Research Data Alliance are crucial to achieve this. Next slide. The EOSC, the European Open Science Cloud, is created and governed by a tripartite partnership. That partnership consists of the European Commission, the EOSC Association, this is the legal entity that is formed by research organizations from EU member states, and finally, the member state governments themselves. And together, they create what we call the EOSC Strategic Research and Innovation Agenda that drives the policy process in the European Union. On the slide, you can see that interoperability is one of the challenges that the partnership is currently working on. You see here a list of working groups uh, for different topics. The Horizon Europe Research and Innovation Programme of the European uh, Commission provides funding for European projects that are aimed at implementing the policies from that strategic agenda. And together, this happens, of course, with everything that is being done within the individual member states themselves. Next slide. I want to point you to this document, which provides recommendations for an interoperability framework. It is produced um, within this EOS context and looks at all four aspects of interoperability, legal and organizational, as well as semantic and technical. And this framework and these recommendations form the basis for all follow-up activities in the coming years in Europe in this area. Next slide. With the last few slides, I want to give you a glimpse of a new European project that my institution DANS is coordinating. It is called Fair Impact. The project is partly a direct follow-up of an earlier project called Fair Fair that you might have heard of. In this project, this new project Fair Impact, we will be working on expanding fair solutions in Europe. You can see that it is a, a cons, uh, coordination and support action, and we receive 10 million euro to spend in three years. We start this month, and we do that with a consortium of 28 partners from 10 um, EU member states and the United Kingdom. Next slide. Fair Impact's main stake. Uh, I'm sorry, um, in the uh, consortium, we have, as you can see on this slide, um, research performing organizations, a couple of universities. We have data service providers like repositories, 
and also um, domain-specific research infrastructures that are truly European, um, for instance, CESTA for the Social Sciences and Humanities and LifeWatch. We also have international organizations, CoData and RDA are also part of our team. Next slide. Um, Fair Impact's main stakeholders are data and metadata providers and repositories. And that is because they play a crucial role in the much needed standardization. Core Trust Seal certification for trustworthy digital repositories is an excellent example, I think, of that. The overall goal of the project is to realize a fair EOSC. And we do that by supporting the implementation of fair enabling practices, policies, frameworks, tools, and we will do this across the different scientific communities. That means also translating one solution from one domain to another. And we will also do that across research outputs. So we will not only focus on data, but also on software and semantic artifacts. And all of this at European, national and institutional level. Next slide. Here you see the seven work packages of the project. We will be doing work in the areas of persistent identifiers, metadata and ontologies, and metric certification and guidelines. We will also um, have a separate um, work package on interoperability in all of its four aspects. And through all of this, there will be a big focus on support, engagement, adoption, and implementation of the policies, practices, frameworks, and tools that we will develop in the project. And for that, we will have multiple open calls. Next slide. So this slide shows you uh, part of the expected outcomes. And as you can see in the red boxes, many of them have um, interoperability aspects. So this is about the, uh, for example, um, coming to uh, a more harmonized use of semantic artifacts, but also creating a framework for metadata crosswalks and mappings between semantic artifacts. And we will also do a lot of work in supporting a network of fair enabling trustworthy repositories because that is where um, a lot of the standardization needs to take place. Next slide. So what are my main takeaways? I think the first one would be that fair is not yet a given for researchers. We need to remember that. And we should not forget that the cultural and support challenges are at least as big as the technical ones. Second, um, data and metadata providers and repositories but also funders and publishers need to provide support to enable researchers to share fair data. And finally, I think it's important to stress that interoperability is a global challenge that asks for global collaboration. Next slide. Um, and I want to finish by saying that Fair Impact will be a very open European project and we welcome anyone who wants to collaborate with us, be it in the EU or outside of it. Thank you very much. Ingrid, thank you so much. Um, I, I'm so delighted to have you here to share all of this because of course I've been you know, watching from afar as, as you've made your progress on Fair is Fair and now Fair Impact. And I, I think it also demonstrates the value of, um, how would you mind taking the slides down? Thank you. Um, I think it also demonstrates the value of um, uh, being open and um, the, the investment that's necessary to make this all happen. Um, I, Bhaskar uh, Ramachandran has a question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read it to you, um, and, but Ingrid, I think you may have really dug in on the answer. Um, Bhaskar's talking about the fact that framing um, the FAIR functions as mutually exclusive strengths or capabilities um, uh, is, is not necessarily very helpful um, because of how much they depend on each other. I'm rephrasing it, Baskar, forgive me. Um, and wouldn't it be better if we um, dug in more in defining interoperability from the, the many aspects of data and software, machine and services and semantics, et cetera? Um, uh, and how do, we, how do we address interoperability at this greater granularity? Um, and I think it just it just jumps right into the problem, right? It's just like, that's great that we're all talking about it, but there's like, it's hard to do this. Um, who would like to, to go after that question first? 
I have two two bits to say on it, Ingrid, and then maybe Ingrid has some more technical. First, is that um, um, sure? I, we we agree, <laughs> uh, and, and I think in, in large part this perspective and the perspective that we've taken is that they are they are not mutually exclusive, uh, and that it is an accident of implementation that the findability and accessibility aspects have been um, have be, have been treated as separable. Uh, and that, uh, and, and in large part, that is a historic accident and not um, the fundamental principle underlying fair. Uh, so yes, I would just say that the first bit is that we totally agree. The second bit is it is it, it is harder um, to start once you have that history. It is harder to reboot and to repair them. Uh, I are back with the FA components, but that is the approach that we uh, are, are are taking. Great, thank you, Chris. Ingrid, would you like? Yeah, to? of course. I also agree very much um, that it's not mutually exclusive. I find, um, I think, I said in my presentation that I even think that fair is um, uh, nothing new in a sense. If you look at the digital preservation community, we've been working on these aspects for a very long time already. So I'm, a, I always have a, a bit of an ambiguous feeling of relationship with the term fair, and that ambiguity also comes from the fact that I, um, what I hate is that we see um, um, that also um, funders and um, are calling out for um, assessments. They want to know how fair data are. On the one hand, you want to answer to that. On the other hand. Um, we need to be very, very careful that we don't exclude communities because fair is a journey. Um, it's not binary, you know all of that. Um, but still, that simmers through the discussions. Um, and I think that um, I see two ends of the spectrum in the sense that on the one hand, I see the great work that is being done um, in RDA, for example, with that group consisting of people from different continents looking at the data commons that are developed here and there to see where, uh, you know, if, even starting with talking um, a common language, that is one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is if I look at my own field, I'm a maritime historian, and you see the debates that we have to come to, in, to, come to interoperability within that small community, um, that is the other end of the spectrum. And that is what researchers are, are struggling with, of course, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I think we need both developments um, and somewhere they will probably hopefully meet. Um, but um, I think we should take it integral and one step at a time. So better to start with small experiments and, and see, find out the things that work and, and also try to translate that. I think that that is also one of the things that we want to do in this new project, to look at the different communities and what they have already been able to, to create for their communities and see how we can translate things, not to well, at least to avoid to, uh, to reinvent wheels. But no, I agree. It's um, it's not. Um, we shouldn't look at those four letters in a separate uh, way. It's a, an integral issue that we're faced with at many levels. You both had on some um, follow-on questions, but before I I jump in there, uh, uh, Shoy had a a really interesting question about: Do we have research on interoperability, and what would, if there's any guideline for that? Um, I think that's a really fantastic question. I know um, Sarah Nusser is in their our participant uh, group, and Sarah's done research on um, reusability, so uh, that piece of it, um, and to some extent interoperability. But I do I I don't know if either of you can speak to that, but I know this is an area that would be really useful to take a more look of a look at. Yep. Okay. All right. Yep. So that so an opportunity. Yes, uh, Shway. I think that's that would be really fantastic. Um, if any funders are online, you might want to do that. Um, just saying it. Yep. Thanks, Sarah. I knew you might be there. I do think that the NSF Pharos um, platform has some capacity for funding uh, research in this area, I, yep. but I'm not. I I wouldn't be able to speak to that directly. And let the NSF. Yep. yep I agree. Yep. The recent um, Pharos RCN that just came through. So that that's for a community as opposed to research directly. Um, but I do think that they're very interested in that. And I know that's where Sarah, I believe, got her funding from was the National Science Foundation. Um, and uh, um, okay, great. Thanks, Sarah. I'll I'll just move on a little bit. So. Um, what so Ingrid, you mentioned something that's been on my mind quite a lot. 
Um, I've participated with RDA not as long as you have, um, but I am really grateful for the international view, for being able to um, uh, work with colleagues across countries, because we know the bulk of our research teams are international and growing. Um, science doesn't get simpler, it gets more complex. Um, and it really takes more than just one discipline to solve these more complex problems. You had the SDGs up from the um, uh, United Nations. And so um, thinking about the researcher themselves and um, they, don't, they don't necessarily even know that RDA exists, nor is there an easy way for them to understand the re recommendations that are coming out. And one of the things I think about is how do I start from the researcher's point of view and walk my way towards these common uh, challenges. Um, if, if, you, if you could tee that up for me um, and then Chris, maybe get your thoughts on that too. I think that that is um, 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 an internal eternal issue, maybe that a lot of that that the the, the supply and the demand in that sense don't meet um, um, automatically. Um, at least I know from my own country that we have always trouble in reaching out to the researchers. For a part that has to do, I think, with the enormous um, pressure that researchers are under. Um, so if it's not directly uh, related to their to their um, uh, the work at hand, then um, there is no time to really dive into that. Um, so I think, well, talking about RDA and the things that are coming out of RDA, the 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 main solution there is, to my mind, to make sure that we have smaller um, um, entities. So you know, at national level um, or even smaller regional level. We need to reach out to the researchers and I think it's up to people like us to make that translation or at least to, to be the, uh, the intermediary, intermediary in bringing um, what is happening there um, to the tables of the researchers. Um, but I think we can do much better at that than um, what we do at the moment um, because we can't expect researchers to follow what is happening in organizations like these. And it would be worthwhile also from, uh, for us um, to have their input because we are, of course, very much demand driven. And it, um, sometimes I uh, feel that um, it would be a big advantage if you would hear the researchers and would listen to the researchers a little bit more. Also in the context of creating our European Open Science Cloud in Europe. I concur with... Um, with the sentiment that Ingrid is, is, is expressing, I, I'd say that this taps into the broader um, or sort of deeper issue of the culture of tenure um, in, in, the, uh, in the academy and that research products um, that, um, you know, that, are, that are adjacent to interoperability, to, fair, to data sharing, let's just say data sharing in general, are not rewarded in the same way that, that publications and that, that individual project and those grants are. And so, you know, work done by Greg Tenenbaum and, and sort of others on, on trying to change the culture, change the incentive structure at the universities themselves is a conversation all the funders need to be having together. Um, we need to be able to give credit um, for research product projects. And once, once that has, you know, we do need researcher buy-in, but they need to have the incentive to want to be able to speak with us. And part of that incentive is like, how is this going to benefit my, my career? And, 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 and help me advance in an environment where it is not valued. Yep, uh, and, and Chris, I think you're leaning in on Amy's uh, question where she's talking about the challenge to fair data is the traditional scholarly publishing system uh, doesn't adequately, and, and I think we could expand that to all incentives for researchers. Um, it doesn't adequately recognize data as a research product. Um, consistently, it doesn't consistently require data citation or deposition. Um, and then how are, uh, how's the US looking at that? How's the European Union look, looking at that? Um, and I'll let you, uh, there's more to the, to the question, but I think that's probably good enough for you guys to get the gist of, of what they're looking for. There was an, uh, um, a research just published by three Croatian researchers who uh, approached 1800 um, um, researchers who published uh, journals in, I think it was epidemiology, 
um, with the data availability policy where only I think 120 or something um, replied and out of that hardly any data came um, to the table to be that were reusable so that shows the magnitude of the problem. And although interoperability, of course, is a big challenge, I think we uh, that cultural challenge and those incentives and changing that whole that whole system in science is um, something that is maybe even a bigger issue. Yeah, I, I would. Um, Mark Parsons in the chat has dropped, a, I think, a very useful resource in this capacity, and uh, and would also direct folks to, to this, um, but. It is, it, it's not just data, it's all research products. It includes code, it, it includes software, it includes other things that um, it, in, in some disciplines don't value patents, some disciplines do. So there's, there, there's, there's also, you know, there's also interdisciplinarity concerns that, that, you know, that we have to address. And from the, from the practice and policy side, we have to, we have to you know, think at the very, you know, we have to look at the forest. <laughs> and the forest is like we want all data products, or excuse me, all research products um, to have these attributes and and to be valued in ways. Um, I, I mean, you can think of something as simple as the review, uh, as simple as 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 editorial review for and peer review. Um, it, it's 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 part of the job in, in many uh, approaches, but it is not credited in ways that that can be. Um, um, I think that this is not that is disproportionate to the actual amount of work that goes into it. And yeah. Yep. And, and promoting um, Mark Parsons' work within ESIP, the Earth Science Information Partners, along with uh, Madison Langseth, they have a working group working on credit for things like that. So they're very near and dear. Um, and I, I'll, I'll talk about uh, Earth, Space, and Environmental Sciences. We, we've been, um, so that's, that's my background and the, where my work has been. And um, we have had really, uh, leaning in work on making sure that journals are uh, uh, all citing the data, citing the software um, through projects like, uh, through teams like the Coalition on Publishing Data and the Earth and Space Sciences and the project Enabling Fair Data. Um, but, in, but when the rubber hits the road, it is incredibly difficult. Um, and we had a, a follow on funding from the National Science Foundation for just AGU to do a pilot to dig through all the issues with getting a data citation machine readable all the way through the publication process, because we ourselves were having an issue with that. Uh, and I, uh, I, it's a little premature, but we should have, we'll have a paper in F1000 shortly for publishers that goes into the weeds on exactly what we found, what we're working on and how others can do it. And it's the complication was far more than any of us had imagined until we dug in on it. Um, but luckily there's folks that are working on it and we're, you know, all the, uh, that, this is where we're, uh, AGU's partnered with Course. Course has been really helpful to do this. Um, we, uh, we have an in-kind offering from our publication partner, Wiley. Um, so that, anyway, that, that is a real issue across publishers, no matter what your discipline. Um, and so it's, it does take quite a lot of effort to, to work through all the challenges. Um, alrighty, let's see. Um, one of the one of the one of the very big problems. Th there's a couple more questions that I've got. One of them is around um, uh, Chris. You were talking about this um, equity and inclusion, and I I've seen on some of the channels that I watch that there's a real worry that if we make science more open, if we make data more available, more software uh, more available in a way that it's it's reusable and such, that we're, we potentially, if we do this poorly, that will actually cause more barriers for equity and inclusion. And I, I wonder if those are things that are being discussed within your community and, and the, how, what is your approach to making sure that that doesn't happen? Sorry, uh, were you directing first first to OSTV, first to me? If you if you can sure yeah, yeah. no no I think I think you're you're um um you are uh, correct in that there is there is a real concern um and, and this again reaches more to the to the, to this to the, the 
culture of, of attribution. And, and so like, if you've worked very hard on a particular um, research product, uh, you have a lot of sweat equity involved in it and, um, and, and you have a sense of proprietorship uh, over that data uh, that you wanna use that data to build your career. And so if you're, it's particularly salient for people early in their, in their career. And so those conversations are certainly being had at the, um, uh, at the interagency. Um, there is, there is a, 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 um, a distinction that we want to want to make clear is, is that, that the proprietorship aspect of, of, of data products from a federally funded uh, research project are, are somewhat different than, than those that don't have uh, federal funding uh, from the US perspective. Uh, it might be different in, in Europe, uh, Ingrid could speak to that. Um, and so the equities issues are, um, are more about a, an acculturation um, challenge than, than an actual policy challenge, I, we think. Uh, and, and, and I think actually culture is harder to, to shift than <laughs> in some, right. some respects. So yeah, so uh, there's, there's that, but there's also, so there's that equity concern. And then there's the, the, um, uh, the, the, which has to do with early, early career um, um, uh, researchers and researchers who have traditionally been left out of the, of the, of the uh, um, scientific enterprise. Um, and then the other is uh, there is the disciplinarity um, equities concern that we that look, um, you know, biomedicine uh, and defense, they get huge, huge amounts of, of research funding and some social scientists don't get as much. And so it's like, well, we have put in a value, we've made a value statement in that in that uh, unevenness, right? The, in, uh, in funding, the value uh, statement is that there's there's uh, more there there, and um, and so there's concern from that side where well, uh, if, if all the la if the labor for getting these grants is falling heavily on um, on one discipline, why would why would we want that to benefit others? They, they're not they're not have they're not they don't have as heavy of a lift to get access to that data. Um, and our perspective, of course, is well. That's that concern is we. This is one way to help even the playing field, <laughs> uh, but that is another side of the conversation that that we've we've engaged in. Okay. Yeah. And I thank you for that. It's um, uh, please keep please keep engaging. <laughs> thank you. Uh, the answer is not easy, but um, I appreciate the the effort that's happening. Um, I would also point um, to uh, not not just not a group that I am on, but the White House's uh, uh, principal uh, group on the Equitable uh, Data Working Group, uh, where they are thinking a lot about uh, equities in the collection, use, and reuse of data from really from a very deep equities perspective. And uh, uh, Dr. Landry Nelson is is one of the co-chairs and leads on that uh, uh, group. Fantastic! Thank you so much, um, Ingrid. Do you want to? Do you want to respond to equity and inclusion and the challenges around open science? Well, maybe short. Um, what I recognize very much is the uh, the the um, equity um, issues around the different disciplines and domains. Also in Europe, of course. Um, also in the context of fair, I think, um, and that is also why I very much stressed uh, this point of inclusivity um, because we see also in Europe huge differences between, um, let's say, the life sciences and humanities, for example. And um, always there is this danger of, of um, taking um, the life sciences as, um, and, and, and their way of working as the Bible and forgetting um, that others have, um, have other needs and requirements. Um, another aspect um, about um, data sharing that is um, not leading um, to uh, better research, but is, is uh, maybe making things worse is the fact that what I also sometimes see is that the requirements that we have uh, for researchers that they need to comply with come um, uh, before um, we provide them the means to, prov to uh, comply with the requirements. So you see funders, um, you know, come and policymakers coming up with, um, with new rules and regulations that researchers can't comply with. And what you see happening then is that they just throw the data over the hedge and they say, you want open data, here you are, have fun with it. Um, and then um, trouble starts. So I think together with uh, funder requirements um, and 
publishers' requirements needs also to come um, support um, enablement um, for the researchers to do all of that. So this is about um, awareness training and training, um, but also support and technical infrastructure that they need. Um, and of course, that element of recognition that we have already been talking about. So you need to have all of that in, in a package to, uh, before you can have um, open science that leads to something. Thank you both. Um, so I'm going to wrap up this session. Um, there's two comments that I want to highlight. Um, first of all, Ishelle Faniel is also in our participant list, and she has also done research on reusability. And Ishelle, I'm so glad you're here. Um, I, I didn't get a chance to say that earlier, but along with Sarah Nisser, the two of them are the only researchers I personally know who are doing research in reusability. So there's an opportunity for the community to do more. Um, and Sarah mentions uh, directing a question uh, to you, Chris, about the possibility of developing a U.S. initiative that's similar uh, to what's happening that Ingrid has been describing, akin to the fair the the fair repository evaluation effort um, and the interoperability and reusability project. Um, it might be an interesting thing for the U.S. to consider. You do not have to answer this because I, this, <laughs> I just take it as a recommendation coming from Sarah as an, a really great opportunity for the US uh, to dig in um, and uh, have some alignment with what's happening within the European Commission, which I think is a, is a fantastic opportunity. And, and that is effectively the same question that I had posed to Ingrid about where the opportunities for that type of modeling might, might be, um, uh, might be uh, uh, synergistic. So thank you, yes. And we'll take that back to the subcommittee in open science. Great, great. We're glad to hear that. That is wonderful. Um, so why let us close out session number one. Um, and Howard, I will hand it to you to introduce the poll. Great. Um, well, first of all, wow. Uh, what a great session. Uh, huge thank you to Chris and Ingrid. That was really fantastic. Um, and also a big thank you to our sponsors, uh, ACS, AIPP, Royal Society of Chemistry, SPAE, and Silverchair. So we're now gonna be taking a break for the next 10 minutes. Um, and during that time, we'd love for you to participate in a short interactive survey um, that we're gonna do via Menti. Um, and you can simply click on uh, the link that Tara has now posted into the chat, which you should also see on your screen. Um, and if you're fancy and you wanna scan the QR code on your phones, you can do that too. And I'll be presenting in a moment uh, what the results are. And again, there's going to be two questions in that Menti poll. So uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks.
All right, it looks like our numbers are slowing down. I'm going to switch us up to the next one. All right, I think we're going to close out the polls. I'm going to switch our sharing here.
All right, so we're back here for session two. So Shelly, once again, thank you, and uh, look forward to hearing uh, from our three speakers. Thank you so much, Howard. Um, so I, I feel like the the we did a really good job laying out the challenges um, and and some of the the opportunities that are happening. Um, and looking more within the realm of the researcher, um, our next three speakers uh, will dig in on areas that they've been working on um, uh, pretty much most of their careers uh, to make a big difference for researchers on uh, interoperability and reusability. Uh, so Corinna Grease is the principal investigator for the Environmental Data Initiative she has a PhD in botany and plant biology. And along with her colleagues, uh, Corinna has guided practices for documenting data to make them as usable to others in the context of ecological time series with reasonable expectation on the researcher. EDI's community of researchers is international and they have been steadily improving their technique for interoperable and reusable data for over 30 years. Um, and the associated research based on this data is quite significant. Um, Jens Klump, is the group leader for the, uh, the research group, the Exploration Through Cover, uh, part of the CSIRO, the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization in Perth, Western Australia. Jens, so thank you so much for being up very, very late. Um, Jens is a geochemist by training and covers the entire chain of digital value creation from data acquisition to data analysis with a focus on data in mineral exploration, minerals exploration, and he has a PhD in marine geology. He's also the vice president for IGSN, the International Generic Sample Number Implementation Organization, and this is a, a globally unique and persistent identifier for material samples. Um, our third speaker is Jane Weingart, a lecturer at the um, University of Cape Town in South Africa in the Department of Electrical Engineering. She's also the chair of my AGU uh, Data Management Advisory Board um, and, uh, and has her PhD in electrical computer engineering. Jane combines the emerging technology of unmanned aircraft systems, the Internet of Things infrastructure, and big data software and high performance comp computing tools to create and enable new mechanisms for science, data capture, and management. Um, all three of these folks are incredible, and I can't wait for you to hear their presentations. Corinna, why don't you take it away? All right, can you all hear me? Yes. See my slides? Yes. So thank you, Shelley, for the invitation. Well, thank you, everyone, to the chorus here for the invitation. I'm honored to be on this panel, and I hope I can contribute a little bit on our thoughts in the environmental sciences on how we deal with data. And when I say environmental sciences, I probably should define this a little more. We are serving what we consider the long tail, which is a lot of research that is done individually, very idiosyncratically. There are no standard methods. There are no standard data formats. There are, well, there are units, but plenty of them. So for the next slide, please. This has been in the making, the EDI, the Environmental Data Initiative has been in the making for over 40 years and it grew out of the NSF funded long-term ecological research program, which is a program that supports somewhere around 30 sites by now and has done so for over 40 years, not all of them, but many. And um, the interesting part of this program is that NSF required that all sites do data management, data archiving, data publishing, and that these data are being made available. And so the whole EDI grew out of local LTR site data management systems. Then we developed a metadata standard in collaboration with the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis the EML, the Ecological Metadata Language. And then building on this metadata standard, we developed the infrastructure for the data repository, for a central data repository, with a lot of input from the LTR data managers, which is now serving a wider community. So we have broadened our, our use to pretty much all environmental data who want to be 
well documented and in the EDI repository. Next slide, please. So based on our experience and our work, we have been thinking about these different aspects of FAIR. Um, I'm with a group that FAIR came in fairly late in our development. So the EML metadata standard was developed long before the, the word FAIR or the acronym FAIR came out. And thinking about FAIR in two dimensions. So one on the bottom here is the dimension of the effort that goes into making data FAIR. And then on the, on the y-axis, you see the actual increase in FAIR data, meaning especially finding and reusing or integrating data. So the repositories in, in our area, and this is definitely not a comprehensive list of repositories, it's just examples here. So if you don't find yours, please don't get upset at me. I may not have known about it. So the ones on the bottom left are repositories where it's very little effort to get data published, get data in, it's sort of a citation level metadata. Then on the upper right, way up in the area of a fair amount of effort and highly reusable and integratable in our area of environmental sciences are the ones that actually have a great on sampling methods. So the sampling methods, the semantics of it, the data format, all is agreed upon and all is available. And those data can be integrated for, across many, many different data streams. They may be very specialized. So obviously Ameriflux has only very certain data. If we go down a little to the left, the GBIF, the PDB, they all have only particular types of data. They don't deal with like everything that comes from environmental sciences. So that brings us to the middle where we find the EDI and the Arctic Data Center and the KNB, which are all based on the EML metadata standard. And here we emphasize that we do a very good job in documenting the context of the data. So the the what, when, where, and especially the how they have been collected. We do accept a wide range of formats, and there is not a lot of agreement on the semantics quite yet. So, which is why it puts us sort of in the middle of these two dimensions of findable and effort to make them findable and reusable. The next slide. So if we try to measure FAIR within our repository, there are obviously several different approaches to do so. There are user interviews out that have asked people, what do you look for when you want to reuse data? And the responses are in our area very frequently, it's the reputation of the data creator. It's how easily I can get them, how they fit into my question, how, what do I know about the data quality? So that is one approach, something that is hard to measure because we don't know the reputation of a data creator. So moving on to the FAIR framework, which was published in 2016. And then as we have heard, the Research Data Alliance or RDA have come up with a framework on how to make this a little more concrete on what FAIR really means and how to measure it. And then for our community, the environmental sciences, which as I keep saying is so much more context dependent, the data one, which is a data, data aggregator in environmental sciences have come up with more concrete measures for the quality or the fair of the data. Then I wanna go into the data use, which may be the ultimate measure for data, for how fair the data are in the repository. And then I, I'm gonna tell you a little bit of a story about peer reviewed data or data papers, which will show why I actually don't like to use the word reuse and touch on data on design patterns. So in the next slide, please. So these are the criteria that uh, between RDA and data one, we have evaluated against our 9,000, over 9,000 data sets in EDI. And you can see it's doing all right. There are some that are not even implemented, but a lot of them are 
the data, most of the data sets have that information available. So that's good, but what we need to keep in mind here is that this is a machine evaluation. So all we can really do here is to make sure that certain elements in the metadata are available. This does not tell me how good the method description is. So how well can I really use these data when I download them and then find that, oh, that doesn't really tell me how these data were collected, even though there is a methods element. So moving on then to looking at how the data from EDI are being used in the next slide or the next two slides, we do have now fairly generalized data use measures. So we can use, we, we can measure data use as downloads, which is the left graph, or in data citations. EDI went into production in 2013, and that's when we assigned the first DOIs to data sets. And that's when the first official data citations started to occur. By now, we have accumulated about 1,500 publications that have formal citations of EDI data DOIs. And we know that there are data sets that are being cited about almost 28 or almost 30 times. And on the other side, we also know that there are publications that have up to 30 data sets citations in them. So that's the range. The downloads are an average of about 400, 500 per day. So that is the range of data use that we can see. Now I've tried to dig in a little more to maybe see if there are certain data that are used more often than others. And this here is a thematic breakdown of the use. So we have abiotic conditions, biodiversity, disturbance, primary productivity, organic matter, inorganic nutrients, and then those that don't have any keywords. And we can see that there really is not a huge significant difference. On the left side, the downloads are broken down into um, what we interpret as manual download through a browser. And the, the gray part is the scripted access through our API. So that's what that looks like. And it really didn't tell me a whole lot of whether there are any data being used more often than others. In the next slide, that picture becomes very different. And we can see that uh, based on the length of observations that are available in these data sets, the ones that have longer term time series available are relatively used more often than the shorter term data sets. And what I find interesting is that the shorter time data sets are really downloaded very rarely. We do probably see a more one-to-one -one relationship between a paper citation of a data set that is fairly short in observation so a more one-to-one -one relationship, while then the longer term data time series are being cited by many papers. So to the next slide, please. And this is the, the story that I would like to tell you because this is a very common data reuse scenario in environmental sciences. So we now have a lot of synthesis, data th synthesis pro uh, projects, which are projects that deliberately only reuse data that are available somewhere publicly or not so publicly, actually, just from your colleague too. And um, this has been promoted in environmental sciences for about 25 years now with actually funding and synthesis centers that are developed or that are yeah developed all over the world and we are now in the third generation here or we're sort of expecting the third generation of the synthesis center to appear and what these synthesis projects are producing is a synthesis data product with many data sets being harmonized into this one product and then a metadata file being developed and these data are being deposited in EDI. 
So to make this a little more complicated, I'm going with this one example that I'm citing up there, Serrano et al. from 2019, the data set. They have used 90 data sets into, to harmonize into one synthesis data products, product. So then they went ahead and wrote what we call a data paper, which is a certain type of publication in which the metadata discussion gets expanded. The content of the data set is, is somewhat discussed and it sort of serves as a proxy for citing a data set. So the metadata now detail which data sets have been used to produce this data product. The data paper is out there and has been cited about 80 times. So is that data reuse or not? This all remains to be seen. Then we also have the documentation of another data set that was spawned from this data synthesis product, which then has been cited by another paper. And we have about 10 papers that directly cite this data product with the EDI DOI. So thinking about this, which clearly is not a very linear process, and where do we start calling it reuse, data reuse or data use? I'll leave that up to you guys. And then in the next slide is a slightly different approach. So these synthesis projects or synthesis data products generally have the problem that they are being generated once and with a certain question in mind. So the harmonization usually already flattens out the information, leaves a lot of the context information behind makes decisions on which data to use, which ones to drop, how to aggregate them. And all of this narrows the usability of that data product in the end, because we don't have all the information anymore. So for these design patterns, we in EDI have gone ahead, worked with that with scientists to find out what is it that they could reuse best. And so the conditions to develop this was that A, we do need to keep the original format because the original format generally had a purpose and the original data creator was not likely to change that. And they probably really wanted the data in this particular format. So we really need the two data sets. Then we needed a format that doesn't lose the contextual information because it is so important for later analysis. And because we are dealing with long-term observations, we need to automate the updates because there will be new data coming into the original data set on a regular basis. We have done one of these so far, which has been the ecological community observations or ecocom DP. And there are about 70 data sets in EDI available in this format. There is an R package that deals with them, that accesses them, finds them, and subsets them. And we're now in the process to test this whole pro process, see whether it was worth the effort, because it's a lot of effort, see whether user will be, users will be able to really get to their analysis faster than starting with the idiosyncratic all different formatted kind of data sets in the first place. And the next slide. Thank you, everyone. This is my team from the Environmental Data Initiative and the latest image of the LTR information managers that all have had major inputs to all of this. Thank you. Karina, thanks so much. It's so exciting to see what's happening at EDI. Uh, Jens, would you like to Go ahead, yeah, thanks. Sure, thank you. So um, the hypothesis that I want to present to you today is that when we talk about use or reuse of data, what we really need to know to be able to do that is to have the data in context. Next slide, please. So when we look at the data lifecycle, this is a very busy diagram, we can see that there are many things that happen along the way and when we are on the right hand side of the slide and want to use this outcome, um, we have to understand what happened before to be 
be able to assess whether we actually want to use this, whether this is, has any utility to us, or whether this is something that we just leave in the archive and not touch again. Um, but where does this richness of information come from? We talk about metadata, but how does it happen along the data life cycle? Next slide, please. So in a very high level perspective, we start often start out in the what I call the private domain where I create some data and I know what it is about. I don't have to share the context with anybody except well, my, maybe my future self if I'm um, diligent in my data management practices. So I can deal with very simple metadata. As soon as I start sharing with my colleagues uh, entering the group domain, then um, I have to be a bit more explicit about my data. And the big cliff is when the project ends and the group hands all their data or other artifacts over into the persistent domain to a memory institution. And this is where usually the context is lost. And then it becomes very hard to understand and assess what the thing is and whether I want to use it and how I can use it. So how do we get from that simple metadata to the enriched metadata that I need in the persistent domain and later, and then access it through the access domain. Next slide, please. So my hypothesis is that one way is that we could capture context along the way. Um, because what we've seen in the, over the past decades is that adding context retrospectively is very hard and actually next to impossible. So we can add context as we go along. And this context sits in domain specific applications, there's domain specific metadata. And all of these elements we can tie together, for instance, with a knowledge graph that is anchored by persistent identifiers. Next slide, please. So in my uh, world of application minerals exploration um, sampling in the field is an important practice and this is not only here but in many other research activities there's a context when we gather data and, and some of that is implicit but we could actually capture that context automatically so when i take a sample in the field i know the date and time and my location by GPS, I know which project and mission I'm on. I know my name as the operator. And then I add some workflow specific metadata to, to, that, to that record and maybe a picture. Next slide, please. What we have to overcome here is uh, breaking the digitization bottleneck. We used to work with paper notebooks and that also really limited the the scale on which we could record um, our, our samples and the, the metadata. And it also, when you look at the handwriting, it, it also degraded the quality. So by partial automation of that data documentation, we could get some really significant gains in productivity and quality as well. Next slide, please. So what we're combining here is an app, uh, FAMES is a framework for building data capture apps. And we're using the IGSN as an identifier and as a tracking number for our samples. So what we did here in this campaign in the Nullarbor Desert in South Australia was we had to access the places by helicopter that because there were no roads. And so time was money and we wanted to have both a fast process, but also a very high quality pro process. So we used this app to capture the, the um, samples. We used um, IGSN encoded in a QR code, which we pre-printed in on the sample labels. And so when we got to a point where we took a sample, we could simply scan in the label, the pre-printed label, use that identifier as the anchor and auto-populate the, um, the metadata record that's tied to that sample. And this could then be brought to the field lab and then like a tracking number could follow both the data and, and the sample itself through the further analytical processes at home. 
and then things going into uh, the archive. Next slide, please. And this kind of um, automation of, of context is not limited to an app in the field, but there have been quite nice examples um, demonstrating how this could be done in the lab where machines produce data. They produce those data in digital formats, but they're not nicely documented in a way that we would want to have in our repositories. But this process can be partially automated. For in, in, I won't go through the details of this diagram, but um, by kind of writing configuration files for the experiment, this allowed this particular process to automate the description of the experiment with metadata. Next slide, please. And similar, similarly, uh, work has been done in the sensor space for environmental observations. Karina just uh, talked about that, but this is more on the hardware and, and data acquisition side, work done by the Alfred Wegener Institute in Germany, where they built a system that starts with data acquisition on the sensor, ingest into the system, dashboards for quality control, a, co uh, a collaborative workspace for data management and analysis, and then a repository and a portal to share the data. So I think this is a very nice implementation of, of FAIR. Next slide, please. So the, my take home message uh, for you today is that for capturing the context of data for reuse, um, let the machines do the heavy lifting. This interoperability and reuse depends on users understanding the context around the data set, but documenting this context at the time of publication, that is too late. Retrospective digitization of context does not scale when we depend on human labor, because we can scale up CPUs, but we cannot scale up um, our staff. So from that perspective, if there's a chance to let machines do the heavy lifting, let them do it. Let them capture the context as you go through the metadata, through as you go through the process and automate the metadata capture and also automate the quality assurance and quality checks. There's nice tools around that will deal with 99% of the cases to let the experts concentrate on just the few cases that are problematic. Next slide, please. So thank you very much for inviting me and thank you very much to the audience for your attention. And on the right-hand side are three links that might be interesting to follow. And thank you so much. Uh, I, I love that you're hitting home the importance of the tools and the instrumentation. Um, so I, I've got a few questions, but we'll hold on it just for a moment. Uh, for others, if you have questions, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A. And our last speaker is Jane Weingart. Go ahead, Jane. Great, thanks. Is that working? It is working. Fantastic, thanks. Um, so, firstly, th this is not my idea. I am highly enthusiastic, um, but I have to give credit to Shelley Dahl here and, and Chris Lennart and Chris Erdman um, for, for coming up with what I'm going to present now. Uh, I, I'm just uh, very enthusiastic. And as Shelley introduced me, I'm coming at this problem from a technologies perspective. So I obviously thoroughly endorse Jens's concept that we throw the machines at the problem. Um, but I'm aware that that is non-trivial and, and does take an awareness of nuance. Um, yeah, but I would like to offer a, a concept that is potentially a pragmatic pragmatic and scalable approach to data and software management. Uh, we, we're calling it data plus, really. Um, but I'm going to focus on the data here. Next slide, please. So yeah, quickly, I'll, I'll very briefly talk about our common challenge from the context and perspective that we're approaching it. But we've obviously heard a stream of very good presentations about that. Um, as an, an engineer, and, and, and I said, I come at this from a technology background. Um, I want to describe this concept of a design pattern and how incredibly useful it is in the technological sphere in the hope that that gives you a place to practically grab onto what we're picturing here. 
Um, and so I'll give you some proposed ideas around what this might look like, but, but please take this as this is draft. We, we are presenting this with the invitation and hope that you guys, the audience here, will, will give us input um, as we are just beginning to, to work out and, and develop this idea out. Um, hence, seeking your input. Next slide, please. Okay, so we've discussed quite a lot the, the potential and value of FAIR and the challenge of the INR. Um, and that this is a common challenge. It is common across all scientific domains. And we're all wrestling with this, including engineering and arguably engineering is one of the sectors doing the worst at this, um, to, to try and put some practical handholds on, on what the challenge is, is common across, to all of us. It, there's a confusing landscape. Um, most researchers do not have the time to be primarily data managers. Um, they are told we need to be fair. And if you actually go and spend the time to look at what does fair in my domain look like, there is both far too much and too little information. Um, there, there is very little that is practically grabbable and, and usable. Uh, there's a question of right sizing. Um, fair doesn't mean the same thing for every discipline. Um, on on a, the simplest level, uh, what fair looks like for the health sciences and the very rigid, appropriately so, legal constraints on what can be done with data in that sector it is obviously clearly very different to, I don't know, me capturing voltage measurements in my lab on some widget I've designed. There's, there's a challenge of not invented here, which is not a, it's not a negative thing. It's, it's not a, I'm complaining about scientists building empires. It's, it's the reality that I trust what I know. I trust what my superiors taught me. I trust what my domain has used for multiple decades. And it is not surprising that I therefore am reluctant to potentially trust that uh, what somebody created in terms of data management for another domain is necessarily applicable or relevant or useful um, in my domain. And then there's the question of usability, the practical, what do I do? Where do I have the time for it? What metadata? Give me succinct real guidelines. Next slide. Great. Um, okay, so what is a design pattern in, in software engineering? So this is, I don't know if that's the first place that this term was used, but it certainly has popularized it um, in a very widespread way. Uh, the software engineering community came up with this concept and it's a re reusable template created to address a common problem. It is abstracted from domain, it's abstracted from implementation, um, but people have looked at a sector and determined that there are common problems that generally we all solve in the same way. And so why not structure them so that it is easier to grab and take that common solution? Um, and I'll talk about how this relates to data in more detail, but generally it's uh, facilitates communicating complex problems and, and your solution. It promotes reuse of existing solutions, which we've heard spoken about lots already. Um, it captures community practices in, in a succinct manner. It improves maintainability alongside the reusability. And yeah, it gives us a structure that we know works. And so it gives you something that when you are confronted with this maze of possible options, um, it gives you a starting point. Next slide, please. Great. And so I mentioned uh, software engineering kind of popularized this. And if you Google design patterns, you will most likely land on a Wikipedia page that <laughs> cites this book uh, from 94, where they categorized and created a set of design patterns for software. Uh, next slide, please. And so again, I'm, I'm trying to make this tangible. So an example from my world um, that I think you guys will all be able to relate to. Uh, we are all dabbling nowadays with smart homes. And so you might well have a Nest, <clears throat> a smart thermostat. You probably have a Bluetooth speaker that connects to your phone. And you might even have lights that you can turn on and off from your phone. Um, it makes sense to have, and this is a problem the engineering sector is not getting right. Um, it would make the most sense to have a single uh, application on your phone that controls all of these. 
And this is an example that maps very nicely to one of the standard and very popular design patterns that that book popularized, which is called the command pattern. And it is just this. Um, this is a class diagram, a software tool, but it really is just the idea that there is a, a client application, the app on your phone, and then there you create a standard template for what a command looks like, and you create a standard template for what a receiver looks like, and you create a standard template for what an executor, the thing that actually issues and runs the command, looks like. Um, next slide, please. So I can map that very easily to whatever coding framework I come from. If I come from Python or Java or C++, how I actually instantiate that will look different. It could be anything from a single script through to uh, full uh, detailed open source object-oriented uh, code structure. But because that template, because that design pattern is there, it's very easy for me to just map that either to uh, classes or functions or even just sections of a file if I wanted to be lazy about it. Uh, next slide. So hopefully that's useful in, in showing you how um, the, the concept of a pattern can be very easily mapped to a real world problem. And in software, that, that original group, um, that book came up with 25 common problems that they saw across the software domain. Um, problems that engineers are wrestling with regularly and, and often applying very similar solutions to it and they just codified it. And, created these things. And that's a whole uh, probably chunk of a course if you're doing a computer science degree to go and learn about these. Next slide, please. Okay, so again, I'm, I'm trying to make this tactile <laughs> effectively, um, but I want to emphasize this is draft. We, we are presenting a concept for your input as to how we could practically make INR easier, really. So, if data design patterns are a reasonable, te reusable template, um, sorry, design patterns are, a data design pa pattern would be a reusable data management template. Um, and in our context, we're, we're particularly thinking about how to practice fair. Um, and one way of thinking about the common problem, so-called, that we, we have as opposed to the software problems is to think about the different data types we are dealing with. So I am proposing just as one example is that, and this comes from the, a lot of the work that I do, there is probably, well, there is a concept of times of time series data. Um, I've broken that up into time series uh, where the sensor or the source of the data is static is in a single location and where it is mobile um, because adding geolocation data to a sensor stream, if anybody works with geosensor, geolocated data knows that is a whole nother layer of complexity. Um, regardless, I think there is a argument to be made for a time series data design pattern. And what that might look like is what data product levels uh, might this uh, a data set need? What ontologies might be most appropriate to it or vocabularies? Uh, what might the minimal metadata or another way of thinking about this, a little more information framework be required. Again, so this is abstracted from any discipline, any specific project. It's the idea that a time series data design pattern probably would have these concepts in it. It would probably have something about data formats. It might have something about anonymization methods. Might even say something about license. But by the time you've instantiated for a specific discipline, it might well say something about licenses uh, and the archives that you would deposit your data into, publication methods, even and probably other things. Again, we're, we're still working on this. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the design pattern would be instantiated for different domains. So in the same way that uh, the software design patterns are instantiated or built out in the real world in different ways and different languages for different domains, we would instantiate them differently. You would pick those, say, their product levels, your licenses, your formats, uh, potential archives, are obviously gonna be different for hydrology or geology or whatever um, domain. So, so instantiating them for specific disciplines would be the next stage. Next slide, please. Um, and then again, my, my hypothesis is that for data management specifically, although we would like to address more than just data classically, 
uh, data plus, is that for there are our problems are different data types, and so that there is a data design pattern for say raster data or qualitative data or unstructured data, or physical samples, um, or what are I'm calling complex digital. So that I'm thinking neural networks or software that that beyond data. Um, and that, yes, the, the, the pattern is gonna be different for each of those. I'm just trying to illustrate. I imagine the problem set, so called, um, for data is gonna be largely driven by the different types of data we, we have. And yeah, next slide, please. Great, thanks. So why, why do we think this is worth doing? Because in the same way as it has done all of these things for uh, software and in other engineering sectors, it reduces your cognitive load. It, it addresses that um, too much and too little simultaneously data, uh, information out there when you approach a problem. It gives you a guide, it gives you a starting point. Um, it addresses common problems and would allow us to amortize all the cost of instantiating these, these patterns. We, there are A within a domain and B across domains. There are definitely common practical problems we are all dealing with when it comes to trying to publish our data in a fairer way. And so it, we can amortize the cost of solving them by putting the same solutions or the same mechanic or framework template behind different um, patterns and then instantiating them for different domains. Uh, again, reusable across those domains. So again, try to reduce uh, net cost. Something that design patterns are not, they're not best practices. They're not standards, they're not documentation, and they're not necessarily static. So I will talk briefly about how we are planning on building these out. Um, and a key part of that is uh, that these would be dynamic and updatable over time. Um, next slide, please. So, uh, we are led, led by Shelley and others in HU planning to, to a trial building this out um, in a RCN-like, if you're familiar with NSF RCNs. Um, this isn't going to be an NSF RCN, just, just in a RCN-like approach. And we have begun already, or, or in the beginning stages of collaborating with Kawashi, who are leaders in the hydrology, hydrology sphere. Um, so as we've heard multiple times this evening, oh, sorry, it's evening for me. Um, this needs to not necessarily be domain or community driven, but certainly led and community and, and domain led and directed. Um, this is this is not um, engineering and computer science come in and save the world. There's no ways that would ever work. Um, <laughs> this is uh, trying to to merge disciplines and, and exchange expertise in a collegial manner. So we are beginning with Kwashi because we have some, I don't want to call them rough, but basic ideas of what some of these design patterns might look like. And so we're going to try and instantiate them with Kwashi for the hydrology sector, and they will tell us what works and what doesn't and what is missing. Um, so beyond that, based on how that engagement goes, the idea would be to build out more of these patterns, determine um, again with the AGU probably and, and broader community, what are those core problems? What are the patterns we need? Um, then there would be a stage of, of engaging with disciplines and say, does this work? Um, then uh, uh, what desired uh, additional or add-on stage to that is to say these design patterns should also say something about enabling diversity and equity and inclusion and accessibility I mean, kind of at the core of FAIR. And so not necessarily at the initial stage, but once we have that set of patterns, um, it would be very helpful, I think broadly for the entire scientific community to then add something to each of those patterns about diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility. How, how does your domain and how your, your discipline and your data type um, enable those? And then again, so these are not, uh, static, they are intended to be um, dynamic. And so there will by necessity be a period of maintenance, maintenance and sustaining them and seeking continuous improvement and adaption and yeah. And then 
obviously there needs to be an assessment and testing. There's um, no way to judge whether any of this is that useful is to apply metrics to them and test it. And I think that is my last slide. Oh, yes, sorry. Thinking <laughs> your input, I should end on this. Um, again, we are at the very early stages of doing this. And now that you've heard all these fantastic uh, presentations on the problems of RNR and some of the really good work that Jens and Karina are doing, attempting to and, and succeeding to some extent um, in, in achieving RNR, what, do you, what, is, what does that make you think of our, our idea? And I'll, pitch. I'll leave it there. Jane, thank you so much. So, so let me help knit these last three talks together. I, I think it's it's important. Um, and Howard, if you could just drop the the slides, that'd be great. Um, I, it, it, the funding for each of our disciplines really matters when it comes to how well a researcher is supported. Um, so, for instance, if you have the benefit of a satellite, um, that's uh, where the uh, the program is funded for high quality data management, data reuse over time, and there's data curators on staff. That is fantastic, and you, but you're only going to see that in certain disciplines. Corinna and Jens and Jane are all talking about, uh, Corinna used this term, the long tail. So this is uh, more smaller groups funding for a specific effort. Um, and that you don't have that program management support coming behind it uh, in order to take care of the, the curation, to take care of the standards that the data needs to be in. So it's a very different kind of problem for a good amount of our disciplines, you know, not only within the earth and space sciences and environmental sciences, but, but across all of our communities. Um, so how do we do this? So, so Chris and Ingrid were talking about the fact that we have high level policy to encourage, if not mandate change within our community. Um, and, uh, and one of the, um, that's fantastic. That gives you um, leverage in order to uh, change directions and change culture. Um, uh, but then Ingrid also reminded us that we every discipline does not exactly have the same level of support. And we need to have the tools and mechanisms in order to help researchers get to the point where their data is well documented to support interoperability and reusability. Um, and Jens reminds us that wouldn't it be fantastic if every single tool that a researcher used in the lab in the field actually supported interoperability and reusability in a way that was meaningful and the burden was lifted from them. Yes, and, and Corinna talks about how EDI and the LTERs have done this for over you know, nearly 40 years in their particular environmental space. And is it a great example? It won't address everybody's research, but it's a great example. And then what Jane is bringing to you is, okay, we don't have a defined pattern that we can go to a catalog and see how does this work for um, uh, Ingrid, your background was uh, maritime history. How does this work for maritime history? We, we have no idea. Uh, you know, if I, if I go to look for what, what is the, the data management recommendations for maritime history, you can't point to a location easily. Now, please, if you're from maritime history and you have this location, please go ahead and put it in the chat. But it's hard to find, uh, especially for cross-domain work. And what Jane is proposing is, could we possibly come at this for, in a way where we can have patterns that help guide our researchers so they don't have to guess as to what the policy is asking them to do. So if the policy says, save your data, you can have a community defined pattern that says, well, this is what's available right now. This is what you have access to right now. Here's what your community recommends right now. And you don't have to guess. Um, so let me take a look at our Q and A. Um, Damien, I see your note there, but I'm wondering if you could, um, can you reformulate that into a question? Um, it's, um, it's hard for me to pull, you make a really good point, but it's hard for me to pull out the question that you're asking. Um, oh, 
Thanks, Damien. So Damien says that's a comment. Uh, talking about the different tensions um, between, uh, and, and uh, uh, it's actually a fairly detailed uh, comment having to do with knowledge graphs and semantic, semantic opaqueness and um, minimal property sets. I think, I think Damien, you're in agreement with this is the fact that this is actually quite a big challenge. Um, great, thank you so much. Okay, great. Um, yep, yep, Mark, Mark is uh, plus wanting on curation and consistent instruments and design patterns. Um, great, yep, good. So I wonder is, um, are, did Ingrid and Chris stay with us? Ingrid and Chris, I wonder if you could consider the, the multitude of challenges within the policy work that you're doing when you can when you're considering you know the fact that one domain might not look the same when it comes to fair compared to another domain and navigating that I mean Jane was very much in the weeds on here is what we could do to actually resolve that but I wonder if you could help bring the conversation up a little bit higher on, um, and I know like the Pharos RCN opportunity from the National Science Foundation is gonna do a huge effort to move that forward. We're really looking forward uh, to seeing who those um, recipients will be. Um, the work that Ingrid is doing with Fair Impact um, is taking a look at that also broadly um, with, with specifics happening within disciplines. Um, the RDA is working on this. Uh, the Go Fair project is working on this, but it's it it would be you know how do you have you had these conversations on those discipline specific challenges? Did I get you set up enough, Chris, to think about it? No, I, I mean it's it, you you actually touched on what some of my answer was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> so, <Sorry>. so <laughs> it's not it again. Just to reiterate on this, uh, uh, or to reiterate the point that I'd raised in, in my talk, and, and then also that that uh, some some of the other speakers and Shelley you brought up is that that there's a real, um, I mean, there's actually it's not just interdisciplinarity, right? There's an interdisciplinarity. There's like one lab to another challenge too, and so yeah, uh, so even within a discipline, there there's there is this high level. Again, it, it is it is. It's steeped in um, it's steeped in the traditional incremental siloed model of science, and and it is very difficult to approach. But yes, those conversations are being had at the high level policy uh, stuff. One of the things that we can do is 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 create incentives, and one of those incentives you mentioned, uh, I was going to mention uh, call out to to the NSF and, and the Pharos um, and the network um, uh, funding opportunities, where there really is a um, a driver. Um, towards um, purposefully uh, creating incentive structures that require interdisciplinary dialogue. And that might be from the infrastructure side where you put people together who are experts in computer science um, uh, uh, with sociologists and technologists who might not otherwise be talking to one another. And that's, that's I think, where we see uh, the again the, to focus on opportunities and rather than challenges, but the opportunity to really help move that forward. Um, the other is in um, uh, so that's that's the NSF. The other I would say is in uh, from a funding perspective, are these multi agency initiatives? I think have been extremely successful in at least getting these conversations started. One that I can call out to is an NSF NIH um, initiative, and if I. If, if, Hold on, because this is just give me a moment to um, conjure it up from my my the the lower levels of my my memory banks here. Uh, the um, uh, it was called Smart and Connected Health Initiative. There we go. So Smart and Connected Health Initiative, where um, where there were um, necessarily uh, very very intentional um, uh, interdisciplinary requirements with that, and I think. Um, from the NIH's participation perspective, there really was, a, a, you know, a, a look towards initiatives that that helped elevate the um, aspects of open science. And so um, I, I'll just um, I can stop there and let Ingrid chime in because I think that um, the EU has also had some really good successes in getting these conversations um, um, going. 
and also some successes with respect to building bridges across those disciplinary sides that you're referring to, Shelley. Ingrid, please go ahead. Yeah, well, maybe to, to add to that, I think that we are in Europe very much struggling with uh, the fact that on the one hand, we have all kinds of generic um, projects focused on the implementation of FAIR and the creation of the European Open Science Cloud. On the other hand, we have had over uh, many years the development in Europe to create domain-specific research infrastructures that are little worlds in themselves who to a certain extent also have an, um, um, an advantage or, or, or um, are further uh, along in their development. And now, of course, the challenge is to bring these generic e-infrastructures that we're building together with the domain uh, structures. And I think what is important to realize is that um, you can be generic and make sure that your tools work for over disciplines to a certain extent, but if you become too generic, um, it's no use anymore within a dom specific domain. So there is a kind of tipping point that you need to touch upon. Um, and I think what is also important, what we are going to try in our uh, new Fair Impact project is to bring in such a generic project to bring in those research infrastructures that are domain specific and to work together with them to see what they have on the shelf, their solutions for Fair implementation and see whether we can have them working together with other uh, domain specific um, infrastructures in our project to see which you know um, implementations can be, uh, can be um, trans uh, transferred to other domains with the limited um, um, changes so um, we will have to see whether that works out in practice but uh, we're hopeful and everybody is positive that we should give this a try I'm so delighted to hear that. Um, I we're just about finished, uh, but I, but I want to highlight and bring in um, a comment that Corinna had made during her talk about, if you remember the diagram on the the data paper, the um, the the data product that came out of it, uh, what was being cited, what was being recognized, and getting credit for this work. Um, which helps fuel incentives for researchers to do the work is not easy at all. Um, and so as we are navigating this, I do think we now need to focus at the discipline level, as Ingrid just mentioned, and as Chris just mentioned, um, and each of our speakers from the second half have walked through these challenges around, um, uh, you know, different ways to approach the data, how we can actually take a look at it, the fact that we need discipline specific answers that help researchers and make it easier for them in order to uh, have interoperability and reusability work. Howard, we just hit the top of the hour. This has been absolutely packed with information. Indeed. Uh, and Indeed. I'm so delighted. So, so it's been great. Um, I think there's a lot, obviously a ton for us all to work on. The community has so much to do. Uh, this today was really about scratching the surface and getting some of those issues out onto the table. I wanna thank all of our speakers today. Uh, we hope uh, everyone found all the sessions very interesting. We will be sharing the recording and we're also going to be sharing an article that we'll be writing up after, after this, which will include many of the questions that came from the QA and also the chat. So um, again, thank you to everyone and I hope you got something out of it and have a wonderful weekend. Bye all, thank you so much.